Sam Samner series. And uh, um, my name is Xiaoli and a facilitator of this series. And this uh, um, whole series is sponsored by um, many organizations within USF, including Cutter, um, student IT chap IT student chapter in the several university transportation centers, including CTEC, NICER, and TomNet. So today, uh, we're very honored to have uh, a great scholar, Dr. Uh, Jay from um, um, Dr. R. J. R. Krishnan, also go with Jay, Dr. Jay, and um, he's uh, actually a professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of California, Irvine, um, for about uh, 30 years, 31 years, actually. <laughs> it's amazing. And, and Dr. Jay earned his uh, Bachelor of Technology from IIT uh, Madras, uh, the <clears throat> best engineering institute in India, and doctorate degree from UT Austin. And uh, he's done lots of great research uh, um, in various topics, like ranging from traffic flow theory, transportation systems analysis, network modeling, decision theory, uh, intelligent transportation systems, public transit, you name it. Um, and he's uh, actually, I've read uh, lots of his papers. And also, I want to note that uh, he's graduated many PhD students, almost uh, half of the them are faculty members, and I'm reading both uh, Dr. Jay's paper and uh, his students' papers right now. So it's a, uh, it's quite qu quite a lot of achievement. And uh, so uh, today, uh, and we're, uh, he's going to talk about uh, something that we've discussed, uh, um, uh, the, the the general topic that we discussed multiple times uh, um, uh, in this semester: shared, connected, autonomous uh, transportation. Um, future, but he's going to talk about uh, the from the perspective of user exchanges of transportation supply. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to give the mic to uh, Dr. J. And uh, thank you, Dr. J. Thank you so much, Shah. This is on, right? Usually, mics mics give a feedback, right? <laughs> this doesn't. <laughs> so, um, um, thank you for the introduction, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, glad that uh, I am on a um, seminar trip uh, out of uh, California for the first time in two years, uh, which itself feels good. I mean. For a while, I know we all felt that we won't even be doing any of these things anymore for a long time. So it feels good, and uh, um, and thank you um, for inviting me for this. Um, so I'll get going with this this topic. It is um, something that uh, um, I've been thinking about and have had a few PhD students work on, um, but rather than just focus on all the details of it. I will show you some of the details along the way. Um, my interest was in uh, getting everybody's thoughts on on some of the ideas that uh, that we are talking about, especially the idea of user ex exchanges, uh, monetary exchanges uh, itself. And, and I'll explain some of that along, along the way. So most of these are, are thoughts and ideas. There are some papers uh, associated with it. Um, but it's, these are early thoughts, so all of you um, having, you know, opinions and comments on it would be very interesting to uh, to to hear about. Okay, so the outline is uh, we'll talk about new mobility systems. All of you know um, what are the challenges. Again, most of us know, um, and a little bit on on the research that. Uh, uh, myself and my students and colleagues have been doing at UCI on various topics uh, connected to new mobility systems, ride share, car share, bike share, autonomous systems, uh, feeding public transit, you know, new paradigms of use of transportation supply, which is what I'll, I'll talk about. And also certain behavior paradigms that might make sense from now on, at least maybe one of 
a family of paradigms that we could use going forward. Um, then how most of this uh, are the result of, are the possible future results of what the private sector might do, uh, as opposed to top-down planning that we have typically had in transportation systems. And then move on to, um, if, if there is time, um, we'll talk about a, a autonomous city. It's like a name that, that I came up with for a hypothetical sort of sandbox platform, uh, modeling platform that we have. So how do we plan for new mobility systems? What are the objectives? What paradigm shifts are needed? Those are sort of the, 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 the topics. Okay, shared mobility, what is it? And I, I will show you one of my favorite little pictures. Now that's shared mobility. That, this is actually from a place in India, very close to where I come from, which is in the southern state in, in, in India called Kerala. You know, this is actually a place called, uh, um, uh, it's near Kochi in Kerala. Uh, in, but that's a few years ago. Now they have like a, a, a big uh, um, overpass over this and all of that. But to some extent, I actually think that this is pretty good shared mobility. That's great capacity probably there. They actually do go uh, move pretty fast out there. It just doesn't feel good to drive through that. But <clears throat> okay, new mobility systems. Oh, that's just to wake you up at the start. And later I'll give a, 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 a bad joke slide in the middle to wake you up again, okay? So new mobility systems. Um, we know that congestion is always a problem. All of us always think about that, but we did, we don't think as much about how much of extreme inefficiencies we have in our system. Um, you know, average private car ridership um, in the US, very, very low, and, and around the world too, right? I mean, we know that it is less than 1.5, closer to 1, 1.1, 1 .1, um, which is pretty bad. Average seat usage efficiency, even worse. Um, taxis with poor dispatching was always a problem, less than 0.8, I mean, less than one, right? Um, of uh, uh, average ridership, which just means taxis are were traditionally doing more deadheading than uh, than traveling with people. Um, so private firms are actually seeing this um, now. Apps can actually make changes. Uh, in the in the past, we had we needed to have top down planning, and you know we will you know it will come from the government, not just in the U.S. around the world. Um, and we had transportation sector, which was a heavy or a high inertia sector, nothing changes, <laughs> you know, we, could, we would do academic research and nothing changes. But now the problem is that change may happen faster than we academicians uh, and all of you, you know, those of you students can do research on, because people might throw something out there and it'll mess up our systems and we will pay for it, right? So we have to actually think about what might happen. So, so there is business opportunity, shared economy, very much possible, but how much of share, what kind of things can we share? Um, that we need to think about. What new paradigms are applicable if you bring in logistics into it, you know, freight movement, et cetera. So anyway, just to get, get started on and connect to autonomous vehicles, everybody has a slide on this, so I'll just throw some pictures. <laughs> right. Okay, these are standard slides from USDOT and all that. All of you know what it is. That, that's actually the original uh, uh, um, Google car, I guess. It looks nicer later, a few years later. But I, I would show one picture which you may not, may not have seen. This is where it all started. I mean, we were doing uh, uh, autonomous platoons way back in 1992. I was in the second year of, uh, uh, of teaching at UC Irvine when this was going on in the San Diego area where a bunch of uh, Lincoln town cars or something uh, they were, um, were driving and they actually had magnets on the, <laughs> on the pavements, okay? Uh, but it was automated uh, highway systems concept that was being studied in California at that time. I was a bit of a critic of it uh, because I thought you had, had to waste one lane to get one lane go at twice the capacities, then what's the point, <laughs> right? That was my, my question all the time. But anyway, uh, these things are becoming relevant again. Flying cars, okay, that's 
up there in the future. At least we thought it was, right, that flying cars would be, you know, way far in the future, just like we thought about autonomous vehicles, you know, five or 10 years ago. Um, flying cars, we think, is way out there in the future, but it actually could happen. But that also had some pretty old beginnings. Did anybody know? Anybody, can anybody guess, guess which year this flying car option was was proposed? I'm sure you won't guess it. 1841. <laughs> right? It's a it's actually a steam carriage. This is before IC engines, okay? Right? And these two guys actually, you know, they they predated uh, uh, Wright brothers. They already had. Plain designs <laughs> in England. So, but they thought it would be running on steam engines, right? Even trains were just about coming out at that time, I suppose. Trains were there already, uh, but early years of trains. Uh, um, so, the interesting thing is they actually made this thing uh, fly within a hangar, a little bit. <laughs> the thing actually flew, <laughs> and then, and it was the fly, the first flying car. They thought of it as more of a of a car rather than Okay, so that was the thinking. So the, the word car really didn't exist. It was carriage still. So it was aerial steam carriage as opposed to horse carriage, right? Um, this is much later. Okay, much later. But even that is in 1947 in California. They actually had a, an actual car uh, with this. Now, this is not my, my topic of the talk. Okay, this is just, again, just to wake you all up. Um, Theodore Hall actually did this. This one actually did um, fly properly um, several miles, I think for like an hour or something, except it ran out of fuel and crashed. It crashed only because it ran out of fuel, but that was bad enough that uh, people didn't take upon it. Um, and the people inside didn't die or anything. But you know, it's this is currently, you know, so this is happening. So just keep this in mind um, that. Uh, um, I, I kind of like Hyundai's vision of it because it actually talks about connection to, uh, you know, transit systems out there, you know, specially made, you know, modular vehicles uh, and, and, and vertiports ports with, the, with a certain design. These are all interesting, interesting ideas. So these are all coming. Let's get back to our current situation. So question, how efficiently is a car seat used? Anybody has a guess? I mean, in terms of percent, I mean, we talk about energy efficiency and all that, right? In 10%, 25%, what's that? 20%, any other guesses? 25%? No, no, I said a car. Well, driver's seat is probably 100%, because if it is, no, not 100%, even then. Driver's seat is probably 15% is my guess. Um, but anyway, you'll be surprised. A car is used for, so now you you'll see my definition of uh, of efficiency, right? So cars are used only for less than an hour a day. They can be used for 24 hours, right? It's very inefficient already, but of course people don't need to travel for 24 hours. So if you effectively look at the period when a car may need to be used, it's probably six hours or something of that order. But an average car is used for about 50 minutes a day, right? So we are talking about one sixth, right, of, of efficiency there. Only less than, I mean, most cars have at least five seats. You know, 95% of the cars have it, right? Um, so that's like a further one fourth. One sixth times one fourth is one twenty fourth. It's actually less than four <laughs> percent. That can surprise you, but I think you 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 are dividing by the six. That's why. <laughs> But dividing by the six is probably necessary, right? I mean, why would we, you know, build a car, waste so much of resources, and and have it there unused for 85% of the time when it can be used, right? We need to do something about it. So this actually gives you less than 4%. One, so it's, it's quite possible that we only need one tenth of, uh, tenth of the cars in the world. Car companies may not want to hear this, but conceptually, why do we need it? <laughs> Many more cars than this. So, um, 
so so what is the reason that we have these cars which are wasted for you know five six of the time that they can be used and then we have all these seats in these cars which are wasted 75 percent of the time what do you think is the reason the reason really is this right it's only because the only way we could do this was to have individual ownership do you agree if, if we didn't have individual ownership and if the cars were available when we when we wanted it then we wouldn't need to keep a car in our garage for 24 hours or at least during the six hours when it can be used without using it I mean, you only use it for 50 minutes right so we won't do any of these things and spend a lot of money how, how much does a car cost an average car per month for people I hundred six hundred dollars <laughs> a few hundreds right and that does not even include a lot of people who, uh, uh, spending the money on a garage y your house actually if you just add the cost for the garage and just annualize it that's not <laughs> that's non trivial it's 40 fifty thousand bucks you are spending probably for that garage or thirty thousand at the time annualize it you'll actually see that that's not, not that's non trivial so all of this is because we could only do individual ownership so can we change that uh, yes two solutions are there one is car sharing car sharing is basically when the same car is used by different people at different times right so that takes care of the one sixth that i was talking about uh, the the five sixth inefficiency six hours we use it only for less than one hour of six when it can be used so car sharing can handle one part. Ride sharing can handle the other part about seats not being used. If people can share simultaneously in the, in the vehicles, then we can handle with ride share another. There is no reason why we cannot increase that 4% to 10%. That's all I'm saying. Okay, I probably can, in my opinion. Subscription services are needed. So these two are essentially um, in in terms of uh, of of a theoretical problem, car sharing it. Is that a question? Okay, all right. Just making sure. Yeah. Uh, so car sharing and ride sharing are essentially the same problem uh, of ride matching, um, as as we can probably see a little later. I'll talk about that. Then we have automated vehicle or autonomous vehicles. Um, they're not exactly the same. Still, rides can be matched without spatial proximity of riders. Cars can drive themselves, so that you know uh, makes it particularly useful for uh, car sharing. Parking infrastructure um, will change, right? Um, and also the, the ride sharing. Also, the 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 first aspect helps in ride sharing also because cars can just go somewhere without a driver so the driver doesn't have to agree right the car itself is is is, is driving um and uh, and it's going and picking up multiple people to share rides so that's possible parking inf infrastructure can change cars can park themselves at cheaper locations so we don't no, we no longer need to waste time I mean, waste space right next to our expensive office buildings and all of that for uh, uh, parking these cars so then the question is, why don't we have shared car ownership, right? Um, how do we do shared car ownership? Okay, um, this was a, a thought that uh, uh, the, the, that we had at UCI um, called mobility portfolios. It's just a term that I that I came up with. Nothing but bundled plans. I know that uh, David Henscher and uh, and group in Australia had also looked at bundled plans. Um, it's similar, um, probably a little bit more general uh, in its in its definition, but I won't get into all of that. But um, so this is the idea, right? Just like a phone plan, you actually have a mobility plan, right? Which is says for 150. I mean, I, I'm I'm looking at 150 bucks a month, okay? And some early modeling, you know, take it for we take it with the, with some serious pinches of salt, but early modeling that we have done actually shows that, yeah, you can do this for 150 bucks a month. You know, um, one third. <laughs> I'm just increasing the uh, the efficiency by 
you know, from 4% to 12%. That's that's about it, right? So it's very much possible. Okay. Um, so if you if you do it um, for 150 bucks, you get uh, five hours a year of a Lamborghini. You know, if you you know, any of you need to go on a very serious uh, date and want to impress somebody uh, with a Lamborghini, you have even that for five hours, right? You get it um, enough probably for two dates, I guess. 200 hours of a Honda or 200 hours of a, of a Chevrolet Spark. These, each of these have different, different prices, but you may only need this for several grocery trips, or you may need the need the Honda Accord, um, you know, if you are taking a longer trip with the family, uh, if you're taking the kids to soccer games, okay, maybe 50 hours of that in a seven-seater minivan. All of these things will come to you when you need it, right? So it's possible, right? If if we can do it that way, it doesn't have to be completely autonomous. It, you can have several versions of this in in ride share form, where people who are driving their cars make their vehicles available. That's also possible. Maybe not a, an option for Lamborghini, but a, you know, a driver, somebody becoming a Lamborghini driver, may be even more impressive, right? I mean. <laughs> You had a driver uh, take you on your on your date, but uh, it's it's possible even with without autonomous vehicles. But with autonomous vehicles, it be becomes really possible. And then additional benefits: lanes can disappear, virtual lanes, dynamic roads, space lots. It's all possible. Can we actually reserve the space on the road that an autonomous vehicle is using? I mean, they're all autonomous, right? Why not pay for the space? In terms of slots, roughly I'll be here or there, right? Uh, and that can be pre-programmed pre uh, if you think about it. Um, not a not a simple problem, but you can think in terms of vehicles having, say, safety bubbles. By the way, this idea of safety bubbles, which are like little ellipses around the vehicles, which is like the area of safety that a vehicle needs, right? Um, and depending on the speed, this this bubble could extend or contract and all of those things, right? So it's possible. Um, so these ellipse kind of uh, a multiple bubble flow view of traffic is possible. If we are talking about more of a flexible fleet of vehicles, now we are actually talking about several people actually using maybe um, one seater, you know, like a motorbike or a two seater, um, Maybe some may be using a, a two-seater car, right? It's all possible. They all have different sizes and shapes. We no longer need, you know, every car to be this uh, this five-seater or you know, um, 16 feet long vehicles anymore, right? For several travel purposes, we don't need it. So if you are using using it in in a, in an extremely flexible way, you can actually imagine that a, a different type of uh, non-homogeneous or heterogeneous traffic flow model can be made that actually assumes that these are all different different bubbles now the bubbles are actually pushing each other and you know it's like a flow of bubbles now if you have a uh, you know how about bubbles actually paying e each other that was where my thought of supply trading came up with so this is you know the bubbles are actually using highway space Right, the bubbles are using highway space. So if if one bubble needs to push other bubbles away and move faster, why not just pay them for it? Okay, can you just kind of move to the side? I will go. <laughs> right, imagine that. If you can pay each other, then if you have more people in your car, then you have more paying ability. Right? You can pay more, <laughs> so you can actually go faster. Maybe it pays to pull. Um, cheaper to pay others for a vehicle bubble. These are all just ideas, okay? Nobody has tried any of this. <clears throat> I mean, I have tried some, I mean, some of my students have done some some little modeling and all of that. So these are all kind of possibilities with automated, you know, be that as it may, we will move on to more of what we can do. So <laughs> challenges with new mobilities is how can we avoid it, added VMT? These are all issues that are actually coming up now, right? Because all of you know that Uber type of services, Uber, Lyft, uh, and um, you know, car um, ride hailing services, not necessarily ride share services, they're all adding to more VMT. They take probably taking 
um, you know, uh, riders away from from public transit, which is becoming an issue. So how can we model or forecast the effect of new mobility systems? Public transit is often quite uncompetitive with street vehicles. So how can we make it more competitive? We need cooperative operation of these kind of systems with public transit. That's the most important thing. I mean, don't look at them as competing modes. We need to think of modes themselves as not discrete modes, but several modes will be there as part of a travel and it's seamless. Uh, the transfer itself being well designed, if you just go back to what I showed for that Hyundai mobility, aerial mobility picture earlier, if properly designed, even transfers, multiple transfers can be done seamlessly, possible. Okay. Okay. Early evidence so far is not good because services such as Uber Lyft uh, have uh, caused notably more BMT. Transit is, you know, is losing ridership. Now let, let's go back to uh, these these general ideas. What if a, a company com comes up with an app? that makes you do this. I'm driving on a car. My app um, broadcasts to, to other cars this thing. You know, can you change lanes and make way for me? I mean, I'm, I'm taking my wife to the hospital for a delivery. I'll pay probably five bucks to every car to move away, right? <laughs> I, need to take, I need to go fast. So I ask everybody to move away. I need to go. I need to go. I pay, right? It's possible. There's nothing that stops uh, 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 the private sector from throwing this app out there. And people might just start using it. Hey, I'll get on the highway and get paid by somebody. That's a great option, right? <laughs> just so I will block somebody's way and that person will pay me. Um, be great. Um, but I actually, you know, we actually studied it. Uh, that's, so um, this is a, a paper that we had. Uh, uh, the titles of these kind of papers are just made to sound, you know, um, unnecessarily complicated, right? I mean, it's part of the game, right? Academic game. So it's NV free pricing for collaborative consumption of supply, but we're actually talking about this idea. But it, this is actually more uh, along the lines of, um, of, of bidding for signals. I'll come to that. Um, so, um, there's also a study of dynamic cooperative trade of Q routing. This is in terms of autonomous vehicles going on, being planned to exit at the right time. Show a bit more things. Now, an interesting side issue here is that we can actually break traffic jams with this. If you think about why does why do traffic jams? All of you, you know, would know why do traffic jams happen? We know our highways can take 2,000 vehicles per hour per lane. Right, but then you look at eight, eight o'clock in the morning. You're seeing 800 vehicles per hour per mile, right? I mean per lane. Why does that happen? If we can do 2,000, why aren't we doing 2,000? Is the question. It's only because everybody gets in at the same time. The density goes up, so you fall on the onto the other side of your flow density curve, right? You're at the high density where the flow again drops. And that flow drop happens because everybody is on the road. So if I if if you think in terms of multiple lanes, if one of the lanes actually just has some vehicles that move to the other two lanes, I mean, it's already maybe 10, uh, you know, um, maybe 110, 100 vehicles or 110 vehicles per mile density on the other two rates, almost parking lot, okay? What difference does it make if if it goes from 100 to 150? You can still have 150 people on that lane. Now, but one lane will clear now, right? <laughs> Once one lane starts clearing, then the other two lanes can come. To, you understand what, what I'm talking about? I mean, it's like because drivers have been not communicating with each other, they can't do anything. That's why we collectively cause the traffic jam. Now, this is just one way of making somebody start clearing a lane. Once you clear the lane, then we can we have a chance to push the operation of the of the highway from the congested region back to the uncongested region using this. So we have actually shown this in a re recent dissertation by um, Riju Lavanya. Don't have a paper to list it uh, list yet. So uh, otherwise I could have 
um, actually gone to that. But we tried the same idea for a, uh, for an earlier paper on um, autonomous vehicles. Now, autonomous vehicles is a different case. So if you think about Q, okay, you can actually have a have a queue of vehicles that needs to leave, and some autonomous vehicles coming in there. And autonom autonomous vehicles can actually create little spaces up in front for a for a cost for a price. So if somebody wants to take an earlier exit, if the others are willing to wait for a payment, right? So these cars at the back are creating a little space by slowing down and and letting somebody who's paying go in front. They get the money. So this is this payment is not going to the government, okay? <laughs> because if you try to do that. That's probably not going to work anyway. Okay, this is budget balanced. This is budget balanced, and it's exchanges directly peer-to-peer -peer exchanges between people or vehicles. Okay, in this case, autonomous vehicles. We can talk about things like NV pre-pricing for it, and I'll come to that. So, what is new conceptually? So, if I am going in a hurry and I'm paying somebody to move away. What is that person selling me? The person in front of me in another vehicle. Space. So it is a, it's a part of the supply that, that the person who is in front of me is de facto owning. right? And that supply is being sold to me. At this time, I don't think there is any government regulation on it, but governments probably can regulate this and just say that, hey, it's public good. You can't sell it. Okay, we are letting you use it. But right now, if an app actually starts doing this, I don't know if there is a law that will prevent it, right? Especially if that helps the, the system. That was my point earlier, right? It can actually help clear our traffic jams. So if it helps the system, why, would, why should we have a law that would prevent it? But the bottom line is they own some supply in time space region de facto. And what is really needed is to break a traditional paradigm that all our transportation systems have worked with. This is like, this is the Bible for tra transportation engineers. Like right? this is like the ten, or first commandment, right? First come, first serve. We do not design anything where we pick and choose users, right? That's what we have always done. Whoever is is there in so. It so happened that the, 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 the driver in front of me got on the highway before me. That was the only reason. So we'll have to break this. Is it fair? In my opinion, it's actually more fair. Because right now what we are doing, if you think about it, if you assume that every person is equal, I mean, I don't want to get into the political side of it. If you assume that every person is equal, we are actually um, subsidizing several of the people who actually have much higher value of time, right? The same way as people who have much less value of time. And really the people who have less value of time probably should get paid. You can make that argument, right? Why shouldn't they, you know? Um, because it, 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 the reason why I say that is both satisfaction wise, it would be, uh, you know, uh, the, if, if you think in terms of satisfaction, how much satisfaction did the did the low value of time person get compared to the high value of time person? That's what you, you need to think about. We are actually giving a lot more satisfaction to the high value person. If you again think about the case, if people are negotiating for this kind of supply trading that I was just mentioning, right? I mean, I'm asking somebody, will you move away? I'll give you five bucks. Why would that person take the five bucks? Because he's happier. Why would I give the money? Because I'm happier. If both of us are happier, why is that unfair? That's my basic question. Just think, think about it, okay? I don't want to say I'm right <laughs> or, or anything, okay? You may disagree, but in my opinion, it's more fair because if both, of, both people are being more satisfied, with the option of trading sp uh, spots in an in a FCFS um, queue or a FCFS service system, if both are happier, then I think it's a it's a good thing. It is fair. Uh, uh, there are secondary effect 
on others and all that. We'll, you know, we will we'll come to that. Um, but again, you you have this issue um, that it actually is sort of changing our view of transport. I don't want to get into the details of it, but if you have actually, I only wanted to point out that if you have gone back to the original definitions of the supply, demand, performance, equilibrium, and all that, it probably goes back to a, a, a classic paper by Florian and Gaudry back in 1980, where they were talking about the demand procedure, the supply procedure, you know, all of it. We are actually making some changes in it uh, with allocation of supply on the basis of prices. So we introduce prices and an optimal allocation of supplies. And what is optimal will depend on how we define, you know, the, the rules of operation. Uh, again, so skip the deed. And I, this also could have multiple operator cases, you know, that gets a little bit more, you know, complicated, but you can actually work through some math of it, which uh, um, Roger Lorre Bettler, who's now a professor in uh, uh, um, Hong Kong, um, is, is working on. And he worked on this other idea, users negotiating. So Mr. Rich guy, I don't know. Um, Elon Musk or uh, or somebody, right? Is <laughs> is there? So I'll pay you five dollars. Um, can all of you? Because you know, I'm I'm about to get a green. The cross direction has has a you know has a red and is a signal operation and probably demand responsive. And there is a, it's going to you know max out or gap out or max out. And and then here comes uh, uh, Elon Musk saying, Ah, I need to go. I'll pay you five bucks. Just wait. I just need this green extension for 15 seconds. If I pay, I mean, if I'm, if, if we are all willing to get, then I probably will. In most cases, you know, get a few cents as you drive, and that's not a good, uh, not not a bad thing. So we act, we actually analyze this case with a proper signal control algorithm, and that signal control algorithm actually break the first come first serve order of signal control. Again, for the same reason that I was mentioning, we were always thinking that minimizing the total delay was the way to do it. But if you actually look at satisfaction on the basis of value of time, that is not the, not that's not what we should be doing in signal control, right? I mean, that's subsidizing everybody, I mean, subsidizing the, the those who have, you know, uh, a high value of time. They get the same same savings um, as as the others. So it's a, um, we brought in a, a behavior model called NV. So again, it's an, another paper title, which is kind of sounds, I guess, more complicated than it. NV minimizing Pareto efficient intersection control with brokered utility exchanges. I'm calling it brokered because there needs to be some rules on it. Um, but we were we are considering. Uh, only cases where it's budget balanced, meaning nobody makes money out of it um, at the system level. We also recently extended it to a route level um, assignment problem where uh, uh, the equilibrium can be defined in terms of uh, NV sort of models. I'll come to what NV models, I'll skip this, but this uh, we were using for the signal control case, we were using um, a cycle free um, signal design, uh, as in uh, you know uh, Larry Head's work um, back in '97 and all that. Um, let's skip that uh, and move on to the idea of individual behavior. So, what is changing in these kind of systems? Everybody is in communication. We have apps that ac actually can do computation for us and even negotiations with others within parameters that we set. It's possible. I mean, this this money exchange and all. People can't be driving and doing that. Right? It's like you have set it into your apps as parameters. This is how much, you know, I would, I would take or how much I would, I would uh, pay. Um, and uh, so now, what is the behavior? Our behavior models that we have had in transportation planning were always on the basis of lack of information. It was never on the basis. We we were collecting data and guessing utility models, right? We we, we calibrate our uh, um, you know specifications and everything, and it's always without any information uh, of in, in real time as as the behavior happens. So what? How will people um, 
re react to the benefits that other people get. So that needs to be handled now. Yeah, so it's 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 only about their own utility achievements that that they care, regardless of whether they are rational or boundedly rational. I mean, this is how we were, um, this is how we were doing our modeling. But is it how it should be? Is the question. What about how they respond to what others get? I mean, isn't that doesn't that matter? If I'm actually doing a negotiation with somebody, one of the thinking is, am I, you know, am I getting what I should get, and is the other person making use of me? Right, so what the other person's benefits also gets into the thinking of the behavior. So you so, sort of need to consider that. So that's where this model that's been there in economics, e economists also have always kind of looked at it as like a boutique model, but it actually gives us a little bit of a framework um, called NV3ness. It, it comes from some classic economics problems of how people cut cakes. You know, cake cut is a classic cake cutting problem that you will find in economics. It comes from that. Um, and I believe we are the first one to actually use this this idea, but I, I, I found that independently, um, Srinivas Pita at, uh, um, uh, at Georgia Tech also had some NB, uh, NB work a little later after us. So. So I'll, I'll take credit for doing it first, I guess. But Srini had some similar thought. Um, so here the idea is that I'm actually comparing my value, value from what I get and the price that I pay. OK, so and I'll compare that with what the other person gets and the price that that person pays. But I don't know the value function of the other person. So that person may be Elon Musk. I don't know that it's Elon Musk. So all I can think about think about is that OK, that is some person. So whatever is my value function, I will assume that for the other person. That is what NB is. Right? If somebody gets five seconds savings, what will I get from that? Is what I would think, right? So that's what the definition of NB is. Um, so it's you, you're looking at utility achievements uh, from one's own benchmark. That's the only idea. Um, there are some details. Uh, economists have not looked at the, the dynamics of, of envy. So if we are actually going to think of envy, um, do we, at, at what point when I'm waiting at, the, at, at a signal, should I consider my envy? What's the dynamics of it at, you know, at what times? It gets a little bit complicated. How often do we feel envy is the question, right? So there is a dynamic envy uh, freeness um, condition that we recently kind of developed in uh, Deshik Nam's work. Just again, uh, just throwing it there as ideas for thought only. Okay. Uh, so now that maybe everybody is <laughs> feeling like sleeping, a little bad joke. Okay. So why did the computer show up late? You may have heard this. Okay. Uh, so I told you it's a bad joke. Okay. Um, so how about influencing the behavior? Okay, we can actually think about this. Now it gets very interesting. Now, how I, the the from now on, I, we are already doing this, uh, right? No, nobody really. Ha the, the 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 classic behavioral models are already sort of dead. Route choice. Is there any route choice anymore? Does it, do any of you ever choose a route? No, I, you, nobody knows any routes anymore. <laughs> It's, it's the navigator that tells you which way to go, right? So it is. It's like uh, you know, classic behavior paradigms are already breaking, and we are not even acknowledging it, right? Um, so new paradigms exist, like I was saying. Um, so most of the time, the the behavior is basically what the system is is giving uh, and making. The system is giving us data and making people do. Uh, like the navigation uh, companies do right now. So user um, decision models for control is what we actually need at this point. What is the behavior which is acceptable right, to the system within the uh, you know, regulations that actually would help the system you know, operate better? Um, not for planning, you know, like we were doing earlier. So then it's a marketing question. So how can we influence the behavior or how can we get people to behave the way we want, right? 
That question is actually a marketing question, if you think about it. Then comes the next uh, question that observations will affect the system state. So depending on how you present this information on route choice or uh, or your uh, uh, supply exchanges or any of those things, you will have this issue, right? So observations affect the system. It's actually a quantum algebra problem. So the, the, you know, the, the problem actually starts getting sort of weird is all I'm saying here. We actually looked at this quantum problem, which actually is very interesting. You can actually think about the, the stated preference and, and, and reveal preference and just kind of connecting that for control purposes using a quantum model. It just, it's quantum algebra, that's all. I mean, it's, it's just called quantum, but it's just simply math algebra, that's all. Um, not quantum theory um, of you know physics being applied to traffic flow or anything. So then let me just kind of speed up on some of these things. Uh, I'm going to run through a bunch of things now, okay? So a future with a personalized and pervasive, this was the proposal that we wrote back in 97, um, and we actually called a system of rideshare, just moving to rideshare systems. Same ideas apply for rideshare, that's why I'm just going to that. So in rideshare systems, you know, you have this, this, this kind of a, of a future that we wrote out, talked about, personalized and pervasive point-to-point -point passenger pool, private, public, paratrack. So we call it P power eight, P P P P P. Um, except my student Christian Cortes, <laughs> at that time, professor in Chile. Now he didn't like that. He just changed it to HCP. He thought it just sounds too funny. Um, so he corrected it to HCPPT, high coverage point-to-point -point transit. Now, this was in, around 2000, okay, much before the company started doing it. So we were just kind of talking about, okay, right share systems. I think it's one of the earliest papers on uh, on right share systems. And and there, again, you have this, this issue. Uber says, it's cheaper to pick me up before you. Can you wait $5? I mean, um, can you wait for 10 minutes? for $5. Why would this problem happen? Turns out that it is, uh, uh, it's very much a relevant, relevant problem. Right now, Uber cannot um, tell you that so-and-so is the driver and change the driver just because a later call made it better for their profit or for even the system benefit. It can even be better for the system benefit for them to switch a driver, but they have already told you that so and so is picking you up. They have no right to make me change that first come first serve order based on a later call and tell me to wait longer, just because it is better for the system and for profit and everything. They can't do that, right? But if you actually let me decide, make the decision, and tell me that, hey, are you willing to flip the order? It's good for you. You will make money. But otherwise, you won't. You won't be agreeing to it, right? It's good for you. It's good for this new customer and it's good for the system. Why wouldn't we allow it? So we actually looked at this as you know, bilateral, bilateral trading as a possibility for permanence in ride sharing systems. Um, it was done by uh, Professor Neda Masood you know, at University of Michigan about six years ago when she was leaving. And same idea, let will just skip the details of why that happens. And a nearby car may decide to pick you up, but the next call comes in, turns out that that car is better for the next call, you know. Um, so it all becomes a ride matching problem. Again, no need to get into the details of it, but I'm just showing the, the reasons for a statement I made earlier that ride matching and car sharing problems are all basically, I mean, so ride, you know, ride sharing and car sharing problems are all a same, all basically a ride matching problem in, in 3D space, meaning, you know, space and time. If you split the network into pieces, it's basically matching rides through it, okay? Um, and an autonomous vehicle, for instance, becomes a, a, a vehicle with a dummy driver in it. That's it, okay? So we actually looked at the ride matching problem in quite some detail, and can we run for some fairly large networks, okay? That was NEDA's work. Um, and then you can, push it to you know further directions you know can can you cars kind of move forward backwards so i can park an extra scooter in between right it, it's possible right um 
Similarly, package delivery, you can actually do this. You know, FedEx will pay me five dollars for an urgent package pickup and near you. Can you? Can I give you two dollars to wait? Why not? Is my question. If if an app, you know, if a company makes an app and throws it out there, why not? You can do this for a freight share a trip uh, option where you have a distribution center sending, um, you know. Um, uh, um, you know, there is like delivery of uh, t televisions from a, a retail uh, center, for instance, right? And there may be others who can actually pick up and deliver, who are flow through traffic, who have space available, they pick up and deliver it. This problem, again, could have payment structures between them, okay? So, but the basic problem is a multiple capacity vehicle routing problem, which is part of Ding Tong Yang's recent dissertation on it. But the, the pricing option of it, of trading, is only currently under study. It's not been done yet, so I don't have results. Drones, you know, moving um, packages between trucks, truck platoons, that's a possibility. Again, a lot of this will happen only if you if you bring in payment structure. So this was that same idea that I was telling you earlier. That all then brings us back to what I started with. If we have enough usage of all these systems, because um, you know people find all the flexibility out there, things can be, things can change, um, order of, of service, everything is possible, then Maybe we can think of a mobility portfolio kind of uh, um, uh, uh, option, but then you have to decide how many hours you need. You might need mobility advisors, like insurance agents. Ew. Okay. <laughs> Looked at it in, a, in a, another recent dissertation of uh, uh, Songi An, um, where she was actually looking at people having and modeling it in the Irvine area, where people are actually given these kind of portfolios you can actually see that under each of those options, including even a helicopter, I mean, which is representative of a, of, of a flying car, I suppose, right? Um, you have so many hours that are available on each of those uh, options, and you, you know, it'll just show how many hours you have left before every trip, and you pick the appropriate one. We actually simulated this for a large number of uh, users, and basically you end up with travel that's all combination of modes. So all your discrete choice models are all, are all out the window already, because these are not discrete choice situations at all. These are continuous choice. How long should be your one option versus another option? Where do I go park my motorbike and get onto the train? Or, you know, all these options. Now, the questions that I had for all of you. So what if private sector starts exploiting using these kind of ideas, if they start exploiting the inefficiencies, we saw that there are serious inefficiencies. What if somebody just starts throwing apps out there? Can you do all this with mobility credits? I think we can. Mobility is a fundamental right. Why don't we do something about it? <laughs> Why is mobility a fundamental right? Um, if, you, if you catch a criminal, what's the one right that we take away from them? We still feed them, still give them shelter, right? What's the one right that we take away from any criminal when we put them in jail? Only one, that's mobility, right? It's a fundamental right. Um, but do we, can we just let the public pay? So can we actually give mobility as credits that they can trade? Good question, I don't have an answer. I think this will, you know, this will work, which is, you know, just let people pay each other. Oh, is it like only rich people can travel? <laughs> I don't think so. In fact, my student that I mentioned a couple of times, Roger Lore Butler, he's from Europe, from uh, from Spain, Barcelona. Uh, you know, true blue liberal, right? So initially he was shocked. No way I'm doing this, right? And then I had to actually tell him, but isn't it worth this? You are taking the money and giving it to the poor. Now he agreed. Okay, all right, then I'll do it. All right? Uh, I I don't have an answer. I don't have you know uh, these are things to think about. How about those who get on the road only to get paid? Right? It's possible. But my point is that all of these kind of things might just come out of the blue. 
we need to be aware that our trans paradigms of our networks and traffic systems need to be a bit more general. We may have no choice but to be ready. Um, so, you know, there's some research going on currently where we are trying to throw some of these kind of ideas into this new project that just started. My uh, um, great colleague, um, Professor Michael Highland, um, and just four of us um, as go PIs on revamping regional tra transportation models, etc. And brings up, uh, it, it's with City of San Diego, but this bring, brings up all kinds of additional questions. San Diego has all these kind of visions of the kind of things that we were talking about, right? But how do we model? <laughs> we, have, we can't just do our stand, standard static planning models. I'll run through this very quickly. I mean, all of you know, you know, we have like a speed flow curve. I mean, very simple problem, a speed flow curve, uh, speed versus flow, right? Inverse of speed is a travel time. So what is our travel time curve as a, just one over that, that curve? It's like a curve that goes to infinity, right? This may be part of um, some of your courses uh, out there. Not too many people talked about this curve. Um, you know, in, in the 90s, um, I, I only know of uh, uh, Ken Small and, and myself at UCI in, in the 90s who were talking about this backward bending curve. Uh, and transportation planners just don't know. We always think that this is like a rising curve, right? Flow is more and we go with the fourth power BPR function and all that. That's not the reality in small time time periods. So if we are not uh, going to model dynamic networks, this doesn't work. Okay, so that ends up becoming a problem. VPR function does that work for a, you know hourly kind of demands and all that? It's okay, right? But the kind of things that San Diego is talking about, they want 15 minutes and five minutes and 10 minute type of responsiveness. Now these models won't work. So what do we end up with? Static equilibrium, traffic represent, I mean, I'll skip this, you all know this. Um, this is a standard, you know, Sheffy's uh, formulation, and we know that this needs, this function needs to be monotonically increasing. If you have a function that goes backward, you're dead. So you need dynamic modeling. <laughs> okay for hourly planning, but wrong for short time periods. Okay, so what changes are needed? We have systems that are very dynamic, okay? Um, very poor in environmental modeling right now. And the dynamic cases is when we have a lot of emissions happening, right? And that's when all our models break up um, because the, the stop and go traffic is never caught. You know, the low flow, high travel time case, the wrong side of your flow density curve is never captured by planning models. So environmental modeling is bad. More choices that we are talking about has always been sort of discrete mode choices. That won't be the case in the future. We, ha we have all these options, different type of vehicles available. It's not like just my car or, or the train. It would be like a scooter that comes to me, somebody picks me up uh, from home, and then I go to some place and an autonomous vehicle takes me for the next 20 minutes. It could be any of that. All perf perfectly coordinated and planned, right? So if that is happening, then more choice models of discrete choice, transit versus auto and all is all out the window. So that needs to change. User demand is even more tied to the system performance. So we need to model it better. So you need you know, multi-resolution models all the way from very macro level, what's known as you know, reservoir models or bathtub models from BigTree and all that, um, uh, meso and micro models that all of you know of, feedback loops at the right places at different intervals. All of this is needed for planning for future systems. We are way behind is my point, right? We're not doing any of these things. And next day we might see that there, is a, there are autonomous vehicles out there, subscription services coming out and we have no models. So, you know, that's, that's sort of my point. Advanced mobility system use real data. They're dynamic. Several options depend on real-time variation of congestion. We need to handle all of that. Modes themselves are not discrete. I already said that. What do we do? Continue with macro models? No, won't. I mean, but that is needed at some level. Standing models, like I said, I'll just run through this. 
this basic ideas we 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 talked about. So we we should actually keep much more of model sets data. Data is available, but it's in the private sector, not with us, not with the government, not with the with the county uh, or MPOs. Very often, integration platforms are needed. Um, we need to have platforms which model all these new type of mobility systems together, which don't exist at this point. Cannot get away without detailed micro and meso level simulation models. Integrated planning platforms are necessary. So we actually made a little platform. I'll just throw the name out there. Autonomy City was a word that we came up with. It's just an area of, of Irvine where we were modeling it. Again, myself and um, uh, and Professor Highland and a bunch of uh, PhD students have been working on it, but it, it includes all the bits and pieces that I was talking about. Okay. Um, household activity pattern problem and activity based demand model, which is like, which becomes even more important now, <laughs> right? Activity based models with chain trips and 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 multiple destinations, etc. now become much more important because many more activities can become part of your travel. Uh, micro transit shared autonomous vehicles. We modeled all of this in a in an area of the city of Irvine um, with the Polaris as an agent based simulation model within there. Well, I'll just throw it out there just so you know that. Um, a, a notion of modeling of the kind of things that I was talking about in a combined form is possible within this autonomy city modeling platform with associated ride matching algorithms and uh, you know uh, peer to peer exchange options dynamic traffic assignment bathtub models it's all um, an activity based demand it's all connected along with you know traffic management you know auctions for traffic signals all of those things are included now that earlier question in terms of how equitable would our designs be but we do have some new new metrics that we can use in terms of people satisfaction, envy, et cetera, which, will all, which are all very good. So it's currently under study on a, just finished this project, don't have papers yet again. Uh, it was a project for uh, PSRU TC, uh, fair congestion pricing that, that we have been working on. So, I mean, those, those are all the talks. So the, the last slides, I was just kind of running over because I wanted, you, wanted to mainly talk about those earlier ideas about peer to peer trading and all of that. So that's you know set of conclusions that uh, that we talked about. Mainly user exchanges with negotiated prices a possibility. Data is important. Okay, so that's where it's. I know I've taken up a lot of your time. Uh, should I answer questions now or? Yep. Any any questions? Hello. Any questions from the uh, online audience or uh, the in classroom? We can entertain a couple of questions. Oh, yeah, sure. Hi, thank you, Dr. J, for a great presentation. I had many questions in my mind, however, you explained most of them. Uh, my question is about, do you think uh, freight companies taking advantage of the space sharing options during their travels? And does it cause uh, bottlenecks for the lanes specifically? Bottlenecks for the regular traffic? Yes, like an extra traffic. Um, so the question was whether the uh, freight company uh, the question was whether whether freight companies were uh, would you know are are using this kind of uh, on the fly you know uh, options of of flow through um, uh, people with extra capacity. Yes, they are. Uh, the there are companies that are running. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, they, this is already happening. Um, you you can act just like. Uh, you know, uh, be, becoming an Uber driver, you can just register, go pick up a package, and and deliver. So that that is there right now. Um, to answer your second um, part, 
uh, I don't think it is to the level where it, they are adding to the road congestion yet. Uh, but I won't be surprised if, it, if that would start happening, right? I mean, this could be added BMT again, just like uh, in the Uber uh, Lyft case. They could just be added BMT, whereas um, if it was centrally dispatched, um, it, it may be less BMT. I don't know. Uh, it, but overall cost into the system cannot be just captured just based on the BMT. And that's that's another issue that, that comes out there. I mean, some VMTs are good and some VMTs are bad, is, is the point, right? So, yeah. So, for the safety aspect, does it um, increase the dri other driver's aggression level? And then that make my make cows okay, this is rich and it's taking my space and time, or I don't know, it, so that I can behaving uh, aggressively. So that may cause um, traffic incidents. In the exactly. Um, or uh, for realize other, like this situation realized by other drivers, and then it's increased envy. So, I mean, of course, envy uh, can be modeled but behavioral analysis might be make it harder. Probably. Yeah, I think there's a very, very good point that I actually haven't looked into much. Um, that that was a, a a good point about uh, um, whether this kind of exchanges could cause aggressive behavior or aggression in people. Um, I my my quick answer is that. If it is left as uh, um, non-mandatory, and it's you know you don't have to do it if you if you don't want to. I mean, so I have always been supportive of the idea only if it is kind of left as right. If you think you'll be okay paying or receiving money and doing something, then do it. I mean, the, the, no, you cannot impose a rule saying you must pay. I mean, I can imagine something like that for, say, emergency service or for the ambulance or something like that. Yeah, okay, that maybe the state should pay for the, you know, for the ambulance service where the ambulance goes first, everybody moves and everybody gets a little money. Why not, right? Um, so I can understand that. But uh, in other cases, it should be left to people. And in that case, maybe they wouldn't get, get upset. Um, but it, there is a possibility, right? I mean, somebody might, uh, might badly program their their uh, app, right? <laughs> you know, you can't perfectly tell your feelings to the app, and so you set some limits, and the app does the negotiation, does something, you end up being late for work for 10 minutes, and then you get really mad, right? So it's possible. Um, so I, I haven't thought about it, so it's a, it's, a, it's a good direction to think about. Yeah. Okay, so, so I see a question from the uh, chat box, maybe. The, the basic idea is, uh, to have uh, the users negotiate with that uh, pricing or credit options, vehicles need to be connected, uh, and uh, that there there might be some uh, uh, like uh, privacy or security issues. And <laughs> well, I don't think vehicles need to be connected for many of the options. For some of the options, uh, it it would they would need to be, but um, but I think for the basic. Uh, um, you know, supply trading, an app on your phone would do. Um, maybe not for the highway, you know, travel condition. I mean, if you think about supply trading for uh, um, for the ride share case, you know, where you wait longer um, and you forego your priority of service, right, for a, for a price, that clearly doesn't need anything. I mean, it just needs, uh, um, you know, uh, an app. Um, even for some of the other options like parking and all of that, I don't think you need an, need vehicle to vehicle connectivity but I, I i i would be very careful trying to do this um without vehicle to vehicle connectivity and a direct vehicle movement control um you know for traffic control purposes so i think it's more relevant for autonomous vehicles than regular people i would think yeah. right so after this uh seminar we will still have a um, opportunity to meet with the um, guest uh, um, 
Yeah, Dr. J at uh, Cotter 207. That's right there with students from uh, three uh, at 3 p.m. If you have more questions or if you want to learn more about the work, welcome to uh, join the meeting at three. Uh, again, Cutter 207 right by here. And uh, uh, so um, with this, I think we could, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think I just want to make a really quick uh, comment on this. I really learned a lot. You know, these ideas are, is especially the, the including the idea of pay you five bucks and buy, buy me the right of way or space, you know. So I think some of these decisions are sort of like uh, beyond human beings, uh, you know, capabilities when you're driving, right? You could at least have some limited uh, communications, but it opens a really nice door for smart vehicles. Maybe in the future, vehicles will, will have their own brains and their wallet. They can pay each other, right? So we need to work with people, industry people or maybe, you know, like start a lab like we do here to <laughs> test all those pilot ideas. And, um, you know, just right now, industry folks are mostly on automation, not so much in connectivity because they don't haven't realized there is a big market. To, you know, I guess they should read Dr. J's papers to learn that there's good market. And or some of you guys or Dr. J's students can start a company to bring this disruptive technology. <laughs> <laughs> sure. With this, I want to, you know, conclude uh, this master uh, of uh, webinar series. This is a really perfect ending, and let's uh, thank Dr. J again for the nice presentation. Yeah. Thank you. We will see you in the full semester. Yeah.